I better go try to find him. Like you're just like, you know. Um, I know, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's like, so it's like it should be there, but it's like. I'll be right. So. I'm just, you know, on one of these little platforms. Okay? Okay, bye. Sit down, yeah. You're the leader today, huh? Yes. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to uh, an extraordinary gathering um, titled Reconciliation 
in Iraq. Um, I wanted to start off just by thanking you all for coming. I've been a journalist for a long time covering Iraq. And any conference that begins with the word reconciliation is uh, refreshing and, and uh, thrilling to see that the dialogue is turning toward reconciliation. Um, uh, I wanted to just start off by thanking the co-sponsors uh, of the event this evening. Um, our co-sponsors are the Middle East Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School, the Middle East Forum at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, and it is in conjunction with the Harvard Middle East and North Africa Conference, or MENA. So thank you all for having us. We have an extraordinary panel to discuss Iraq and reconciliation and the possibilities for that um, and what role particularly the Arab states can play in that um, and the wider regional context. How can this be achieved? What needs to be done to move the ball forward in that direction? So I'm going to briefly introduce our speakers and then uh, we'll turn it over uh, first to Milton Viorst who will do uh, some historical context and laying of the land. Um, I should start by probably introducing myself. I'm Charles Sennett, and I am a uh, journalist. I worked for many years for the Boston Globe covering the Middle East. Um, I've worked for 15 years covering the Middle East since the first Gulf War. Um, during that war, uh, my first evening in the Middle East was spent in Israel with Scud missiles raining in, and I went into a bomb shelter with none other than Jackie Mason. If any of you know who Jackie Mason is, he's a borscht belt comedian who made us all somehow laugh in the middle of this very scary night. As it turned out, the Scuds were like throwing Buicks into the air, nothing to be afraid of, but it certainly didn't feel that way at the time. And it was a pretty horrifying night. And as I learned from my first night in the Middle East, if you ever have an opportunity to laugh in the Middle East, laugh. It's, it's a beautiful place. I was lucky enough to live in Jerusalem for a while. I've traveled throughout the region. I have a great passion for it, a great love for the people, um, and a, a great desire to talk about reconciliation. Um, I covered Iraq. I covered Afghanistan on the ground as a correspondent. Um, my newspaper, the Boston Globe, um, is, is a great one and gave me that opportunity to do that. They also gave me an opportunity to come here to Harvard University where I was a Neiman Fellow, a great year. And um, after my Neiman year, sadly, the Boston Globe, like many news organizations, closed its entire foreign operation. Uh, there are no longer any foreign correspondents at the Boston Globe. Um, there's no longer a foreign editor. And this is a sad uh, day in newspapering when a great paper like that has to make a decision like that. But the economics of newspapering, as you all know, are bad. So I've left the Boston Globe six months ago and have started a new news organization called Global Post. We are hiring 70 foreign correspondents in 53 countries. And our website launches on January 12th. It's globalpost.com. And I wish all of you would check it out and let me know what you think. So that's my story. Um, I will be uh, moderating tonight, and I want to introduce our speakers. First, uh, Mr. Ambassador Hussein Hasuna, who is Ambassador to the United States for the Arab League. Um, ambassador David Newton, who is currently an adjunct scholar at the Middle East Institute. Um, he returned to the United States at the end of 2004 after having served for six years in Prague as the first director of Radio Free Iraq. Uh, Dr. Judith Yaffe, uh, a research fellow, Institute for National Strategic Studies. Um, and before this role, she served as the director with, excuse me, she served with the director of national intelligence in the Office of Near Eastern and South Asian Analysis. I'd like to start with Milton Viorst, who is an American journalist and author who has published a series of books focusing on the Middle East, and they include Storm from the East, the struggle between the Arab world and the Christian West. What makes tonight unique is the opportunity to have so many different perspectives coming at this issue. But Milton is going to start by
by providing a historical context. He will speak for 10 minutes, and the other panelists will speak for five, giving their perspectives, and then we'll go to questions. So Milton, thank you. Thanks, Charles. Um, while I was uh, preparing the remarks uh, I've been making, um, I came across this cartoon in the New Yorker. I know you can't see it, but I'll tell you what it says. It's uh, uh, two American couples sitting in their bikinis, smoking cigarettes and drinking martinis uh, with the mountains and the trees behind them. And one of them says, I think that if these Islamic fundamentalists got to know us, they'd really love us. Well, the, con the cartoon contrasts uh, two extremes. Uh, I call them the uh, secular Sybarites and the, uh, uh, the spiritual zealots. Uh, and though they're minorities in their respective cultures, it's fair to say that this cartoon contains an important reminder that cultures shape value systems, uh, value systems that may be sharply at odds with one another, uh, creating conflict. That's what we're talking about tonight. Well, bear with me uh, for a brief excursion into history. I know I'm in a room full of scholars, but, but I hope you will be tolerant. Uh, I think I need some of this information to make my argument. Um, I'd go back to Mohammed if I could, but it would take too long. So let me just begin with Napoleon, who in 1798 launched Western imperialism in the Mediterranean basin. Uh, the British soon drove him out. They were his imperial rivals, uh, but the practice of nibbling away at the Ottoman patrimony at the Islamic world in the Middle East uh, continued. France took Algeria in 1830, the British to tighten their ties with India, settled into bases in the Gulf. In 1882, after the canal was dug, the British grabbed and held on to Egypt. Uh, as long as the Ottomans survived, they were a shield against Western penetration into the Arab heartland. But in World War I, the Ottomans fell, inviting the conquest of the Arab world. We go back because the war that the British fought against the Ottomans was actually tougher than they had anticipated. Uh, and after their defeat at Gallipoli, we all remember the movie, uh, they adopted a backup plan to exploit the new rising phenomenon of, uh, of Arab nationalism. In Sharif Hussein, who was the ruler of the ancient Arabian kingdom of Hejaz, they found a collaborator. Sharif Hussein uh, is the great-great-grandfather of the present King Abdullah of Jordan, and he had the dream of liberating the Arabs from four centuries of Ottoman rule making himself king and caliph of a united Arab uh, uh, nation. He agreed to raise an Arab army uh, to rebel against the Turks in return for what he, he thought was a British promise, um, a British promise to help him realize this dream of Arab nationhood. His army fought alongside the British through Palestine in 1917 and actually entered Damascus in 1918 which led directly to the, Arab, to the Ottoman collapse. But what Sharif Hussein didn't know was that the British had been secretly conspiring with the French to divide the Arab heartland between themselves. He learned of the plan just as the United States was entering the war in 1917, and he was buoyed by President Wilson's pledge to base the post-war settlement on Arab national self-determination. But Wilson never really took on the Europeans, and, British, and Britain and France planted their flags on Arab soil from the Mediterranean to the Gulf. Uh, the Arabs, by now their national vision shattered, uh, went from Islamic rule under the Turks to what they considered even worse, that is, Christian rule under Britain and France, provoking a greater than ever distrust of the West. <clears throat> well, the Anglo-French empires didn't last very long. Uh, um, uh, <clears throat> the Second World War followed on the heels of the first. But it was an era of unremitting conflict. Uh, most of it was at a low level, but the long-term cost in lives and in resources was very heavy. The United States ignored that lesson and produced an almost carbon copy of that in Iraq starting in 2003. 
Well, after World War II, the United States pressured Britain and France to give up their Middle East colonies. They, uh, Britain and France, bargained for political concessions, bargained for military bases. I suspect it sounds a little familiar, but the Arabs insisted on full sovereignty, and though it took a lot more bloodshed, they finally got it. <coughs> well, Arab liberation seemed to promise a harmonious new relationship with the United States, but the reality was quite different. The Arab-Israeli conflict generated a lot of bad blood between them, but no less important was the Cold War in which Washington tried muscling the Arabs <coughs> into taking its side against the Soviet Union. Story goes that Gamal Abdel Nasser, Egypt's leader and would-be chief, chief of the Arabs, uh, pleaded with John Foster Dulles, our very moralistic Secretary of State, to understand that the Arabs never had a quarrel with the Soviet Union, but rather needed time to convalesce from the Western imperial oppression to build new institutions. Dulles, however, insisted that the struggle was between good and evil, and the Arabs had no right to stand aside. And so the moment, the moment for some sort of rapport between the United States and the Arabs was lost. And over the ensuing decades, the US routinely denounced the Arabs as communists, and itself came to be seen by them as the replacement for Britain and France as the great imperial villain. In 2001, George Bush inherited this relationship. That September, uh, two of our cities were attacked by Islamic extremists. Um, clear thinking was one of the victims of this attack, these attacks. The United States had a plausible case, I think, for seeking to uproot the attackers from Afghanistan. But even after insiders had revealed so much about White House deliberations, the motives for our invading Iraq uh, seem ter certainly terribly mysterious. Um, can we hypothesize that the there was a surfacing of an atavistic urge within Bush and his colleagues to renew this age-old struggle, imposing the values of the Christian West on the Islamic East? Well, now, after six years of bloodshed, where more than 4,000 of our soldiers have died. It hardly seems to matter how the war began. Uh, much more important is the confirmation of our recent election of a national consensus, an American consensus, to bring this involvement to an end. But what we found is that it's not so easy to get out of the war. Not only did our forces cause a huge amount of useless physical damage, what's worse, uh, we have unleashed furies within the Arab population which our leaders seem not to have known existed and which have already cost tens of thousands of Iraqi lives. Despite claims of success for the surge, these furies still kill Iraqis daily and threaten to degenerate into intensified civil war when our army departs. Behind the furies is a political structure transformed on a Western model in the name of democracy, the United States triggered a revolution. One could argue that it was long overdue, but it spun out of control without our having the faintest idea of how to handle it. The Iraq we invaded in 2003 was ruled, as it had been for centuries, by a Sunni minority. <clears throat> the Iraq we leave behind us will be ruled by a Shiite majority. Nothing we do will change that monumental shift in Iraqi power. Now, the Shia, now the Shiites will look, us, look upon us to preserve this shift, while the Sunnis want us to restore at least a modicum of their past prerogatives. It seems true that our military uh, has helped to marginalize the extremists on both sides, but the occupation has done virtually nothing to abate Sunni-Shiite animosities. We have failed to persuade either camp to give its allegiance to a constitution under which the two of them can live amicably together. Ironically, the transformation we have managed, or mismanaged, 
is, from today's perspective, contrary to our national interest. An Iraq ruled by Shiites seems less likely to make a common cause with us than with Iran, our declared enemy since Khomeini overthrew the Shah in 1979. And please note, I haven't even mentioned the Kurds, a minority which aspires to, nation, to nationhood of its own and has all but seceded from the Iraqi political system. Uh, the three groups seem to agree on only one thing, and that is the need to free Iraqi soil of the United States Army. <coughs> In short, the United States, though now resigns a departure, seems without the authority to impose the stability that an honorable withdrawal demands. America carries the baggage, uh, not just of the Arab world's 14th century struggle with the West, but of the ill will generated by European imperialism. And why should Iraqis now put their confidence in a power that for six years has laid waste to their towns and villages? Um, most Iraqis believe the U.S. was out to grab their oil. Most Iraqis believe the huge expenditures on military bases that we have made signal our intention to stay on permanently. The United States' occupation of Iraq has piled distrust upon distrust, which leads me to think that the, the time has come to look around for some help. Well, where? I'd argue that we must turn to the Arabs themselves to help us out of this mess. The Arabs, after all, have an even greater interest than we do in Middle Eastern stability. As a community, I believe they've had enough bloodshed, enough disorder, <coughs> enough of the killing of, of those who have spread death in their name. They still yearn after an utterly dysfunctional half century for the era of calm and convalescence that Nasser spoke to Dulles about, to build institutions for a society that can compete in the world. Milton, may I say, you're at 10 minutes and a half. OK. I'd like and to I've give got... you a minute to, uh, <laughs> All right. to, okay. to wrap. Well, I contend that as a, as a change in strategy that we look to the Arab League. In Lebanon in 1989, the Arab League, after American intervention had failed, brought an end to a seemingly intractable civil war, not just between Sunnis and Shiites, but between Sunnis, Shiites, Christians, Druze, and even Palestinians who had been butchering one another. Uh, after a few weeks of bargaining, the Arab League agreed, persuaded the participants to agree to a, uh, an accord in which all made vital concessions to restore peace. It didn't produce permanent harmony because, let's face it, Lebanon may never attend permanent harmony. But a year ago, when a crisis erupted over the election of a new president, the Arab League again stepped in at a Congress in Qatar and worked out a compromise that headed off renewed violence. Milton, I have to interrupt here and say we're going to move on. OK. OK. Um, I wanted to, it's interesting, we, we, we end there. And it's a nice transition, in a way, um, directly to you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, I'm doing brief introductions because I am assuming you all have a program, and you can read in more depth about the different panelists as you uh, look at your own programs. But um, Ambassador Asuna, I wanted to just turn it over to you and, and hear your thoughts. And if you could try uh, to keep them to five minutes, that would be much appreciated. I try. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank the organizers of this event and to all of you who came. It shows the interest uh, which, which this issue uh, arises. Um, I am an Egyptian diplomat. I spent a long diplomatic career in the Egyptian Foreign Service. I've been involved in, in trying to find solutions to all these problems in the peace process, Iraq, Lebanon, and so on. So I try to bring you some of my experience, how I see things. Uh, first of all, the issue of, of Iraq is, is a local problem, it is a regional problem, and, and it is a global problem. But however we try to approach this issue, we have to realize that 
any approach, any solution concerns the people of Iraq, their destiny and their fate. And it is up to them to choose what they want. It is not to the neighbors, it is not to the United States or anyone else in the world to impose on them a kind of solution which they do not want. This is my first approach. The second thing I would say that the issue of Iraq is not just an issue related to Iraq itself. It is a, an issue related to many other issues in the Middle East, to the issue of, of oil, to, to the Arab-Israeli problem, to the neighboring countries and, and, and their role. So it, we have to approach it in a comprehensive way and not just looking at Iraq as an as a issue on its own. What is the role of the Arab League concerning Iraq? The Arab League is a regional organization. Uh, it, it is encouraged by the United Nations to play a role in trying to settle uh, regional issues. Even the Charter of the United Nations in, in Article 52 talks about the role of regional organizations in, in finding solutions to, to regional problems. And it has played over the years uh, many in many instances, a role. Uh, I think, Mr. Vyost, uh, you mentioned uh, Lebanon. Uh, it is trying also to find a solution to the, to the questions of the Sudan. In the past, it has reached uh, some solutions when Egypt and, and Syria had a new union that broke out in 61. The question of Kuwait in 61 also between Iraq, uh, the border problem between Iraq and Kuwait. So it has played a role. It has shortcomings, like any organization, Sometimes the members uh, have different views. It has financial problems. Uh, uh, organizations adopt resolutions that, that are not implemented. This is the case with many organizations. But still, the advantage of the Arab League is that it represents Arab legitimacy. Like the United Nations represents world leg legitimacy, the Arab League represents Arab legitimacy. And then the other advantage is, is that it is neutral and it has no agenda of its own. It's not like any, any outside power who is trying to promote its, its own interest in dealing with an issue. The Arab League just wants to settle the problem, to, to, to have peace and security for the region of the Arab world. This is the advantage. What role it has played in reconciliation? Uh, it has been very active. It has convened in, in, in 2005, in November 2005, a big reconciliation conference at the headquarters of the Arab League all the different factions of Iraq took place, the political leaders, the religious leaders, the sectarian leaders, and it was followed up by another conference in 2006. The Secretary General of the Arab League, uh, Amr Musa, has gone to Iraq. He has met all the leaders again. He went to uh, uh, Talabani, uh, uh, the, the leaders of the Kurds. He met uh, uh, Sistani the religious uh, leader, and, and he tried to, to promote this, this understanding and, and, and urge them to, to, to reconcile. Uh, the Arab League has also opened uh, an office in Baghdad, and a good friend of mine, Ambassador uh, Khalaf, is, is our representative there. Uh, the Arab League has urged all Arab governments to send high representatives, which they have done gradually so. Uh, it has also called for the forgiveness of debts to, to, to uh, help the Iraqis rebuild their economy. So the Arab League has played an important role. It is facing problems. But the question of reconciliation is an ongoing process. And each time the Iraqis are agreeing on something like they just agreed a few days ago on the security agreement between the United States and Iraq, it has meant that they had to get together and to reach a compromise on that. They have adopted laws on, on, on uh, a budget. They have adopted an amnesty law. They have released prisoners. All this has been difficult because there are different factions, different views, but it is a dynamic process that is moving on and slowly and slowly I think Iraqis are getting to realize that they have common interests, that they should stick together and, and, and that they should rebuild their country. So I think it's not easy, but we have to be optimistic. And finally, I would say, because I think this is the title also of our theme today, what about the next administration? 
a lot of expectations, uh, a lot of hope has been generated in the region, but caution also. Caution because we know that it's difficult. We want the new administration to be more engaged, to support more the Iraqis, to listen more to their views, to help them not to divide, to be, uh, to, 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 to emphasize the divisions among them, but to emphasize what unites them. And then, first and foremost, we want the, United, the, the new administration to, to settle all the issues of the region and not just to focus on Iraq. The Arab-Israeli problem is extremely important in the, in, the, in the minds and the hearts of the people of the Middle East. So, so are the other issues. Uh, there must be dialogue with, with Iran. The weapons of mass destruction issue should, should be approached with a comprehensive approach. There should be a, a region free of all weapons of mass destruction, which applies to everyone, including to Israel. So it, the, we need a comprehensive approach in dealing with all the issues of the region. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, Dr. Yaffe, uh, if you would go next for us. Thank you very much. Morgan for 10 minutes instead of five? <laughs> uh, can we you know what we can do seven? is, what, what, what we can do is say, This is let's, the Middle East, I want to haggle. Well, <laughs> I think in the, in the spirit of that, I think, um, I think Mr. Ambassador was at seven minutes. That's, that felt perfect. And why don't we try to keep it's it even, to five? I'll give you a warning at five and give you time to finish um, up because the questions are always so great. I, I, really agree, I couldn't agree with you more. And I do agree with much of what the ambassador said, and I was delighted to hear him articulate it so clearly. Because I think there are a couple points that, that have um, kind of bothered me um, about the study and about the recommendations. Because the bottom line is, who isn't here? And the bottom line is, whose problem is it? And I think the ambassador said it very clearly. This is Iraqis' problem to solve. But there are no Iraqis here. Now, maybe some were invited, maybe not. But uh, how many times uh, can you ask these questions and not have the Iraqis present to answer them? My favorite question that I hate to hear is, aren't you sorry now that we got rid of Saddam? Because look at, look at the chaos in the region. Why are you asking me that? Why don't you ask an Iraqi? Ask someone who had to live through these things. And ask some of the Americans who've been out there how they feel. Uh, to them, it's, everything is real, and the motives are not mysterious. Um, so I think that, that is a problem. I think we have to remember, too, it's hard to instill a love of all the values we have, constitutionalism, rule of law, because they had rule of law, Saddam's law, and constitutions can be paper. It's to it build a spirit and a belief in the system, and that doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and it doesn't happen in six months, and it's not, it doesn't happen in, in uh, six years. So I think it's an important point. Um, I do have to correct you on one thing, Milton, forgive me. The Kurds do want us to stay, so they don't even, there is not even agreement on that. Uh, but the point I want to get to is, and it's what the ambassador said, um, I'm kind of I'm underwhelmed by this argument to put this burden on the Arab League, which has great limitations, but this is an Iraqi problem. And I'm reminded, too, of the role of not the League so much, but the Arabs themselves. If I think about it, as I try to do, because I've been looking at Iraq for longer than I'm going to confess to, but it's a long time, um, and I try to think about this, the Iraqis who are in power today have, have created a deliberately, uh, you could call it a deliberately dysfunctionalized or de decentralized government. Uh, but also, they have very little trust for the Arabs as such. Why? Because where were the Arabs? Uh, when they needed them. You're talking about a government which is dominated by Kurds, by Shia, and even by many of the Sunni. And I, some of you may have read, if you were a student of mine, you did, Cruelty and Silence by Kenan Makia, who says, where were the Arabs? He writes for two points of view on Cruelty and Silence. One, Saddam was an equal opportunity oppressor. Everyone suffered under his rule. And secondly, where were the Arabs when we needed you? And the Arabs don't have never accepted that as an argument. They say, oh, Ken Makia, he just, he's just an Iraqi nationalist. He doesn't think like an Arab. But the whole point is that there is not a great basis of trust. And the neighbors haven't been particularly helpful. Yes, they have made uh, moves on uh, forgiving some of the debt, but there's, they've been very slow to come to terms with the kind of cooperation that is needed to uh, make Iraq secure border security, for example, help meddling in Iraqi politics, 
uh, funding militias and, and extremists. This hasn't been for the good of Iraq, and I think that um, these are the kind of things that stick out. Syria has profited by benefiting the uh, Ba'athists and the tribes and the leaders it's benefited from. Everybody has had a hand in this, uh, including the Saudis. Now, the basic flaw, though, I have to come back to it, uh, is that the proposal ignores Iran entirely. And it is Iran that is the closest to this problem. A 900 plus mile border, a common history, uh, many things in common and many differences. And I have to say um, that I think in this, and I know I'm running out of time already. <laughs> I always have this obsession with time. You have one minute. Please. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't worry about Iran. I don't have an Iran obsession the way many people do, because I don't think that the Iraqis are that naive or that simple uh, or that trusting. That yes, Iran has been there to help. They can't get rid of Iran. They can't say, go away, we're going to build a wall. The Iranians are there and have to be dealt with. But I think in the fullness of time, as it says in Quran, uh, the Iranians will leave as well because they are not uh, well loved. Uh, many Iraqis who belong to these, uh, many of them who belong to the clandestine parties, many of whom are in government who are Shia, they don't like what the Iranians are trying to do, the kind of controls, the kind of leverage, uh, and the shape that they want Iraq. Uh, will Iraq be the eastern flank of the Arab world? Maybe not. But I don't think it's going to be uh, happy to become the strategic, what's the word I want? Strategic depth for Iran to protect it from its enemies. So let me conclude with this thought. Iraq is a work in progress. We can't expect it to be where we say it has to be or we're going to go home. Um, the Iraqis are going to determine that. And you can put any coloring you want on it. But I think that um, I, I'd end with this. I understand the dislike of. Bush's policies in this government. I haven't liked them either. But I think that sometimes we get carried away with um, our judgments and our feelings about why we're there, what we've done, uh, and how do we get out of there. I work at a military university. But how do we get out of there with honor? But let's get out of there. But I think the point is there are a lot of things, God, I, I can't begin, on the, the, that the Bush administration didn't get or didn't want to get, or arranged to get what they wanted. That's a topic for another, another evening. But one thing I think we have to keep in mind, that in their idealistic moments, they talked like Wilsonians, the uh, Bush and the people around Bush. And they, there's a simplistic kind of a, a judgment. We're here for democracy, whatever that means. Democracy means rule of the majority. Can you now say you don't like a Shia government that was elected simply because it's too close to Iran, but it's too close to us as well, and Iraq has to get along with both sides? Do you say to Iraq, we're going to make demands, and Iran has to think about this as well, we're going to make demands of you that might weaken this government. But this government now has to depend on both sides, and I, I'll say goodwill loosely, or lack of bad will, but they're going to have to depend on both of them. In turn, we can't ask more than they can deliver. And that means the timelines, the benchmarks, and all of those things. But just to get back, and in conclusion, uh, democracy is a funny thing. The Iraqis know what democracy is. It's rule of the majority. They don't get that part about protecting minority rights. And that takes us to national reconciliation. And maybe they'll get there, but it doesn't ha you don't make it in a great leap. There are a lot of resentments. This is an area that remembers its history as if it were all yesterday, whether it was 1,400 years ago, whether it was 1920, whether it was 19, whatever, whether it's today. So I think we have to uh, try to understand that. And again, the Bush administration, Mr. Bush was, uh, was uh, he's already gone, an imperial presidency. Imperial presidents never have to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, and you shouldn't expect that. Uh, democracy, they have elections. Uh, let's just hope that we leave having done a minimal amount of damage. And I, I, I said in the beginning, you have to talk uh, to the Iraqis to get a point of view there, because I think you'll find that there's, uh, it's a lot less black and white than is very often posed by politicians here and critics of the administration.
Thank you, Dr. Yaffe. Thank you very much. Um, Ambassador Newton. Yeah, first I'd like to thank the school for inviting me. I was last back uh, a year and a half ago for my 50th reunion from the college, so it's nice to come back even as an old, old grad. <laughs> but uh, I really want to talk mostly as, as someone who's been a practitioner, although I've had a lot, long time intellectual and academic interest in Iraq. Uh, but I was really a practitioner. I was ambassador during a very eventful time, the second half of the Iraq-Iran War, uh, including Iran Gate, which I just soon forget. <laughs> and then six years running an organization, except for myself, uh, entirely composed of Iraqis, Radio Free Iraq. So I've worked with Iraqis a lot and ran an organization of Iraqis. And I'd like to focus uh, not on the foreign policy aspect so much, but on the issue itself of, of reconciliation and to make some generalizations, maybe a bit outrageous sometimes. I hope I don't offend anyone, but it's based on my experience. First of all, I'm sure most or all of you are well aware that Sunni prejudice against Shia has existed for a long time. It's a historical phenomenon. I think in general it was somewhat less strong in Iraq uh, it is certainly less strong than the animosity between Iraqi Arabs and Persians across this border where they had fought wars for many years, and this, this animosity still exists to some, to some degree. Uh, now, it's uh, perhaps also less strong because of just the sheer size of the Shia community, and uh, I think they, the, the Shia resented their po long-time political exclusion, and they hated, of course, the terrible, violent mistreatment they, they received under Saddam. I think this, these things were more important to them than the religious prejudice itself. And I think we also need to remind ourselves that Shiism in Iraq is less than 200 years old. Uh, it's, it's stronger now than it was before, but I still believe many Shia are still not all that religious. If you ever want to go into historical trivia, you can read the story of how the the southern tribes became Shia. It started in, in, uh, in Imperial India with the, when the British wanted to go to war against the Nepalese because they were such notorious bandits, but it's a great story. Uh, secondly, we need to be realistic about uh, the, what's possible in Iraq. Uh, the ethnic cleansing of just very few years ago was really horrific. i just tell you, my daughter worked for a couple of years for a prominent NGO in Washington, which arranged uh, visitor programs for Department of State visitors. And she uh, had a program, took care of a program. She has a master's degree in Arabic, and she took a program of a number of Iraqi teenagers. And she said, talking to the teenagers in, in Iraq, in, in ba from Baghdad, who were both Sunni and Shia, they said they were wonderful people. They took advantage of every opportunity here because they said Iraq was like a prison. Every time they went out of the house to school, they saw dead bodies. They, they were in fear of their lives. And they said sadly to her at the time about three years ago, if we had our choice, we'd rather have Saddam back. It was that bad uh, by some young and very honest people. That, his, that horrific cleansing, like other ethnic cleansing, is largely irreversible. It wasn't total as in Cyprus, for example, but you simply don't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You can do some partial remixing, and some areas remixing still exists, but I don't think you can do it on a wholesale basis. And if you talk to people in Washington who work on the refugee issue, they will tell you they want to get people back, but they don't imagine that very many of them, many of them in, in Baghdad particularly, can go back into uh, into uh, mixed Sunni Shia communities. Nor can we expect intercommunal inter violence to be entirely extinguished. There is going to be a certain level of it in the future, and maybe for some time. But it is vital for the country to reach a stage where middle class refugees, especially those in Syria and Jordan, can, can feel safe enough at least to return. They're not needed just to restore health, education, technology, and other sectors. But they're the people who are most likely to cooperate along sectarian lines. Iraq is a, is a strange country in a way. I always said it's almost like two peoples. This is a country which, in my view, 
had on a percentage basis, maybe the most cultured, best educated, most intermingled, most even intermarried middle class in the Arab world, uh, certainly close to the top. At the same time, if you talk to Iraqis in the past, they would if you would talk to non-Iraqi Arabs in the past, they would tell you Iraq is a country which was noted for violence. Maybe it's due to many factors, its location, its harsh climate. It was the, the, the war zone of the Ottoman Empire. But violence, unfortunately, is not unknown in Iraq. The, my other experience is that working with Iraqis, they have find difficult working too, in a cultural level too closely together on a personal level. And uh, in fact, we have to admit, they have had very little practice in recent history because of the nature of governments they've had, uh, where you simply did what you were told. Well, to go on, uh, I spent a good bit of time working on Lebanon on the Civil War, five years, and from 98 to, uh, from 88 to 90, I was the director of the office for Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and PLO affairs. And I worked with a very, dis we all worked with a very distinguished Arab League mediator, Ambassador Lachda Brahimi, who later became a UN Secretary General and in fact received a very significant award from the law school not too long ago. But working on that subject, I came to sort of, if you forgive a fairly simple comparison, that large-scale inter-ethnic, uh, inter-communal violence whether you call it civil war, it doesn't matter. Large-scale intercommunal violence is, becomes much like a large forest fire. You cannot put it out. You have to contain it, and largely it burns itself out. I think that did happen in Lebanon, and, and the recent history of Lebanon shows the aversion of the Lebanese in the, in the last analysis to violence. I think to some degree this has also happened in Iraq, and is one of the reasons, along with the with the surge, with the new military policy, uh, and with the success of the ethnic cleansing to reduce the level of violence. Now, reconciliation is going on in places in Iraq. It is not going on all that well at the senior, at the government level. Uh, there's a good deal of criticism of the prime minister. He's, that he's not doing much to promote it. He says, well, it'll be taken care of by the elections but there's really very little, very little preparation for the January 31 municipal elections and local elections. Uh, the Kurds continue to make very tough demands. Uh, they occupy 70% more of the country than, than Iraqi Kurdistan is, is, uh, is comprised of, and they want, very much want their share. The Sunnis want their share of the action. They're, they're going to struggle among themselves to see who's in charge on the Sunni side. And the big issue of how many of these Sunnis from the Awakening Council will be taken into the security forces or other places is still very much, very much up in the air. The surge, uh, I certainly didn't think the surge was going to do. It did a lot more than I thought and some other people thought on the military side, but politically it has not done a great deal. Now finally to reconciliation. You can organize it and fund it from the outside, but I agree very much with my two fellow panelists. On the ground, it must be done by the Iraqis themselves, but they do need some help with formal training. Our, our own military is now trying to do a great deal of it, working very hard on it. And I would draw your attention to the United States Institute for, of Peace, which has a, a very substantial and uh, commendable program. It's worked in some really dangerous areas like Sadr City, Adamiya, which is the religious Sunni center in Baghdad, and has trained more than 150 Iraqi facilitators. Uh, that's not saying that uh, outside uh, Arab and even non-Arab Muslim organizers couldn't be very desirable, but they cannot have uh, sectarian agendas. And there is a significant problem in picking countries uh, since you have both Sunni and Shia in the country. The cachet of an international organization such as the Arab League, such as the UN, could well, could well be useful in giving a, an aura of neutrality. But again, I would say the Iraqis, despite their lack of practice, they need help learning how to do it. It is, of course, very much a traditional society with honor and revenge. But you do read stories about Iraqis saying, we now have realized the futility of it. So 
it's well worth examining the subject, and I'm sure we'll get many good questions. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists. I think, I, 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 yeah, I think we could even take a minute to say thank you. Um, uh, it's really an extraordinary amount of depth of experience here, and I really uh, feel like there's a lot of ground we can build on to even maybe leave tonight, I'd hope, from the panelists with some sense of consensus on um, what, is, what, is, what is a wise framework to begin to build um, toward reconciliation for this new administration. But I want to invite all of you now, or those of you who have questions, to go to the microphones. There are four of them. There are two up and two down. We have three ground rules. Uh, the first is that you identify yourself clearly. Um, the second is that you please limit it to one question and make it a question. Um, and also, I love to say this, no journalists, please. Uh, no, journalists get to ask a lot of questions, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll sort of wait on them. I want to quickly say, while those of you who have a question line up, I want to quickly say that um, I wanted to share a couple of, of, of observations and ask a quick question to get things going. The observation is that I have spent time recently in Iraq on the ground, um, and that I saw, I saw grounds for hope. I felt that I hadn't been back uh, for over a year and a half. And when I was there in April um, of this year, I really felt the ground shifting toward, toward a more positive environment, at least some evidence that the surge was beginning to set the stage for movement. Uh, I, I felt that in talking to Ambassador Crocker, who I think is deeply knowledgeable, and to General Petraeus, who has an extraordinary sense of um, the reality of that place. Um, but I felt it the most, I wanted to say, in the neighborhoods where I went. And that was in Rashid, in, in Baghdad, where there are micro fissures all through the Sunni and Shia communities. And you could see neighbors, uh, people who had been forced out of their homes, trying to return, working with, um, with a great unit that was operating in there, uh, a US military unit that was really working with the neighborhood and creating what they called reconciliation halls. And it was a very interesting uh, on the ground experience that I thought gave me a little bit of encouragement. At the same time, you leave Iraq feeling, where do you begin? And that would be my question uh, to get things rolling. How do we find a framework, more importantly, how does this new administration, how does the Obama administration find a framework to begin to work toward reconciliation when um, you could argue the, the Arab League has had great efforts in this direction, but it is perceived as predominantly Sunni. It would be, uh, therefore, raise some questions among some Iraqis. And the United States certainly would have a difficult time providing that framework, considered we have a vested interest in blood and treasure and have, have made some serious mistakes there. Where does it begin? Where do we find that framework? And what should this administration be doing to establish that framework? I throw it open to the, to the panel, whoever wants to jump in. I wouldn't mind just saying, I think you have to start with the international community itself and try to get some consensus, uh, maybe working particularly with the UN, but also the Arab League, to figure out how it would be done. But it ha first of all, on the ground, it has to be done by Iraqis themselves, right. but with encouragement from people who are trained and who can train them. And secondly, you have to have the agreement and cooperation now of the Iraqi government. I mean, the withdrawal is no longer if but when. And if you look historically at these kind of withdrawals, they almost always accelerate. Mm -hmm. So, and there's going to be a referendum. I think probably uh, the president-elect 16 months looks realistic to me, especially if this agreement is turned down in a referendum and, and okay. the one-year notice. So you've got to engage the Iraqi government, which is not easy at all. But you, I think you start with finding out who's ready to do it and can they work with each other, uh, facilitators. And money, of course, was, is important. Uh, yep. But the Iraqis themselves, and there are Iraqi NGOs and others who can be helped uh, to do this. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, I, I will agree. Um, I think uh, when you look at what President-elect Obama has said, first of all, he is in favor of a multilateral approach to problems, and not a unilateral one. And I think this in itself is, is a way of, of settling some of these problems. Secondly, talking about Iraq, he was very definite that he wants to work with the neighboring states of Iraq to find a solution to the problems. And again, I think we welcome this. You know that the neighboring states of Iraq, they have periodic meetings. Every six months, they meet. It means the Arab states, it means uh, Iran, it, mean, it, 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 it means Turkey. So uh, they're all involved because they all, as I said, this, this issue is, doesn't just relate to the Iraqis. It, it relates to, to the whole region. So these meetings are important. And then, of course, internally, this is crucial. The government has, has lately created some structures, some, some, some committees within which there are talks and dialogues between the Iraqis. And I think this should be supported. The question of, of Shiite and, and, and Sunnis, well, it has existed. It does exist, not only in Iraq and the Arab world, but we should not deepen these divisions. Sunnis and, and, and Shiites and, and Kurds and, and Muslims and Christians and Jews have lived in the Middle East for centuries together. So there is no reason to, to, to say that these have to, for instance, the concept that has been put forward, and, and I would say by, by some congressmen in, in, in this country, that Iran, Iraq should be partitioned partitioned according to sectarian mm. and mm. ethnic uh, lines. This is unacceptable. They, 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 they called for, for the north uh, being Kurds, the south Shiite, and, and, and the west uh, Sunnis. How do you do this? Iraqis are, are interrelated or, or intermarried, interlinked. So to, to, to reach this, this is for calling for, for ethnic cleansing. Mm. And it is not the concept of federation. Federation is you divide the country uh, without, without uh, not on an ethnic uh, uh, or religious uh, basis. So I think this should be rejected. And mm -hmm. there should be a strong, strong policy for the next administration to keep Iraq together as a un united country that has common interests. If you, if you talk about division, the, the, the Kurds will try to, to become independent. Mm -hmm. The, the Turks will, might invade, the Iranians might try to get hold of the South. It, it, it will be chaos. Mm. We have to keep Iraq independent, strong, and united. Thank you. Yes, and could you, I, I want to get to, I, of course, if you want to, but I do want to get to other questions. Do you want to? <laughs> Dr. Yaffe, go ahead if you had something no, I you just wanted. wanted to, it's simple. First of all, the Iraqis, are, you have to look at from inside Iraq, which none, nobody has here. Yeah. Uh, they are survivors. Uh, they are not going to commit national suicide. I agree with your optimism in the sense that they've managed to come up mm -hmm. with political solutions, maybe not perfect, but at least they're talking. The good news, they're acting like politicians, just like Boston politicians used to act Chicago, the big city machines. That's bad news as well, I realize, but the point is that means that there is a basis for negotiation. Lebanon is not a model. I think in the long run, Iraqis have to learn not to do things by the numbers. If you're 30% of the population, you get 30%. You've got to have a Sunni here, so he's got to have a Shia and a Kurd. We have to get, they have to get over that. Uh, and it's a, very much a matter of who gets what and why. They're not there yet, but I think that that's, there is reason for hope. Uh, but I think the important point I would make here, Lebanon's not a model. You cannot guarantee that each sect will own certain parts of governance. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Go ahead, and if you would identify yourself, please. Sure. My name is Teresa Chewy, and I'm a, a citizen of Massachusetts. I just like these farms. And I've been following this, um, this since 2006 when I helped Admiral Sassak get elected in Philadelphia and went down in, to Washington and heard the Iraq study group recommended and it basically be ignored. Mm. So the question I have is, and I don't mean to complicate this, but I feel as dreaded about this problem as I did in 1987 when I was a student 
in London about Ireland, where my ancestors were from. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if there are any really important lessons from that reconciliation process that Senator Mitchell's um, team could help with. Mm -hmm. He came up with some very good principles for Northern Ireland, and this many years later, there's so much progress there that um, yeah. I wonder if any of you have looked at that. That's an excellent observation. Uh, one of the le messages I would take away from that and want to whisper into the new administration is uh, we need to find someone who is senior, highly respected, who has the credentials to come in. A uh, George Mitchell for Iraq would be nice, a special emissary, whatever you want to call him. But it takes someone to bring the factions together. But they can't be, uh, you know, they, they have to command respect or they have to have some kind of to, to lend uh, credibility to this uh, so that people, the Iraqis want to participate. Great. I'd just like to add one thing, and that sounds a little simplistic, but you know, in, in the United States, we say uh, money is power. I think you could say in Iraq, power is money, uh, because this is a society that really doesn't have a private sector. A lot of the struggling for power means to get closer to the trough, let's be uh, Mm -hmm. honest about it, mm -hmm. to get to the oil revenues and control them. That's why, and that was not a condition really in Northern Ireland, that's why it can get a lot bitterer and more difficult and sometimes more violent. But the ideas in principle are fine. The, if you can get, it's, it's possible in Iraq, I believe, I agree very much with Judy, it's, you know, it is possible. Uh, and like her, I don't worry tremendously about the Iranians. The, the Shia have not waited for decades to come to power in order to hand it over to the Iranians. They're going to keep it. And Iraqi Arabs and Persians historically have not liked each other all that much. Mm -hmm. I realize there's more ties. But I think uh, there are possibilities, but it's a lot more difficult situation, I think, uh, in terms of violence and dangers mm -hmm. than Northern Ireland. I think, Mr. Ambassador, also your theory of of sort of a forest fire approach to it will eventually burn itself out. In Northern Ireland, the people led the leaders. The political leadership in Northern Ireland did not achieve peace. The people did. did. And, uh, and the US had an opportunity to play a unique role there. One name I'll offer to you as a great person to talk to about this is Porig O'Malley. Porig O'Malley worked very hard in Northern Ireland, and he yes. worked very hard in South Africa toward reconciliation. And he's recently convened uh, some 20 tribal leaders, Sunni and Shia, to go to Helsinki for his own little private <laughs> reconciliation effort. But he's a fascinating and, and forceful character who lives here in Boston, uh, works through Tufts University and UMass Boston on reconciliation. And he'd be a great resource. But Milton, you had something you wanted to add. Yeah, I, I think there's a rather substantial difference between uh, uh, Ireland and Iraq, uh, one of which is that um, um, we are not faced with, the Iraqis are not fa are faced with a, an occupying army, which the, with the, uh, you might say the British are the same, but I don't think that the British presence in Iraq is anything like the Western presence the British presence, excuse me, the British presence in Ireland is anything like um, the uh, American presence, the American occupation army uh, in Iraq. And I don't think that, um, I think we have exhausted, I have a very high esteem for um, Ambassador, uh, uh, what's his name? <laughs> no, our, our ambassador in Iraq, who, who is a, Ryan Crocker, Ryan Crocker who, is a, who, is a, who is a wonderful guy, but I think he, he, he he operates with the handicap of being an American in an area where we have exhausted our credibility. Mm. And I think that's why uh, I keep hearing over and over again from all the members of this panel that the Iraqis have to solve this themselves. And I think that's absolutely right. Um, uh, the British were very good about going into Iraqi uh, discussions with the Iraqi government and telling them what to do uh, and then announcing that this was an Iraqi decision. I don't think there's anything like that, and I don't think an American diplomat, even one as skilled as Ryan Crocker, uh, can do that. I think really that it's time to turn this over to the Arabs themselves, not just to the Iraqis themselves, because they need some intermediation, mm -hmm. and I don't think our intermediation 
uh, any longer uh, has any value. Thank you. Briefly, just throw out one more comparison since we made. I'm talking to someone working very hard on this issue, also worked in, in, uh, uh, in the former Yugoslavia, said to me, it may not be easy in Iraq, but it's much easier or considerably easier than either Kosovo or Bosnia. Mm. Mm. So it, it's tougher than some, but <laughs> yeah. easier than others. I also, I, I think, uh, just having been a reporter observing Ambassador Crocker, I came away as a reporter who's been very critical of the lack of understanding and sophistication all too often of the State Department in different regions. Watching him from Pakistan, uh, from Lebanon, Pakistan, and Iraq, and thinking he's an extraordinary ability to, to recognize what That's everyone right. agrees, agree. which the Iraqis Absolutely. have to be at the core. Thank yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Cameron Tybus. I'm a student at the University of Texas. Um, I had a question for Mr. Ambassador. Would you be able to tell me what the Arab League stance is on the whole refugee problem? Is it um, or stance or hope or plans? Is it, it, it stance that the United States broke it so we should raise our own intake limits from, I think it's about 70,000 right now for all kinds of refugees? Or should the um, neighboring states try and absorb as much as possible? Or is it going to try a mass repatriation scheme? Or what would it like to see happen? Of course, you talk about the Iraqi refugees. Yeah. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's a question which, uh, which is the, the result of, uh, of the war, of the destabilization of, of Iraq, uh, which, uh, which the Arab states uh, have been warning about before the war started. Um, they were against the war because they thought that Iraq would be destabilized. The society has been traumatized. And that is why we are seeing this happening. Uh, sectarian strife, uh, we're trying to stop it uh, through reconciliation, but it has also led to, to this problem of refugees. Many of them have, have, have gone to Syria, to, to Jordan, to, to Egypt, and they, they have created problems for those countries. Uh, it is, it's a financial burden. Uh, it is also a, a political problem, all these large communities, how, how they can live there and get integrated to the society. The Arab League is, is, has, has tried to help. It has uh, created a fund to try to, uh, to, to give assistance uh, to those refugees. Uh, it has worked with the Iraqi government. And I must say that a lot of them uh, have, have started to go back. Because once uh, uh, there has been a kind of stability, uh, once the, the, the violence has subsided, uh, they, they were encouraged to go back and, uh, and maybe be compensated and so on. But it is a very acute problem, and it is not solved, but I think it is on the, on the way to, to, to find a solution. Did anyone else have something to add? Okay. No, I agree with you. Okay. Hello, my name is Adil Qureshi. I'm a guest. I'm an attorney living in New York City. <laughs> Uh, first, I'd just like to thank you. This has been a very informative panel. Um, we've heard quite a bit about the Arab League's role in promoting reconciliation and the role of the Obama administration and the, uh, the role of Iraqis themselves. Um, in my view, a predicate to reconciliation is a power-sharing agreement, and um, I'm hoping that you might be able to speak more about what the different ele elements of that might be and if we should be looking toward a federal system. Dr. Yaffe said that um, Lebanon is not a model. So if, uh, maybe you want to elaborate more on that or maybe tell us what, um, what other arrangements uh, we could be looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <coughs> that's a tough one because that's what they're debating. Um, I don't know what federalism means. I mean, we live in a federal system. The Iraqis say they want a federal system. But it basically comes down to who's going to have local power. The Kurds want more than they have. And they've been practicing exactly what was practiced against them, ethnic cleansing, and a demand that the Constitution be followed to the letter of the law. But they helped to write the Constitution to, guarantee, to build in certain guarantees. What I'm thinking is this. You have a complicated and a fragile system, uh, which is trying to redefine itself quietly. The, pre the prime minister is arrogating more and more power to the central government 
and the more that he does, and he's, he's been creating these councils that in effect are loyal to him, that's what his opponents within his own party accuse him of. The Kurds don't want councils that they don't uh, control and own. Um, does this mean that we're, they are really doing something that the Constitution was supposed to uh, prevent? In other words, the Constitution says this will be a weak central authority, decentralized government, most decisions, if not any, all the important ones, made in the center, made in the provinces. And here's the president says, well, uh, Prime Minister, we can't defend ourselves. We have to have national authority. And everybody else, especially on the outside, agrees. But it's a struggle within. To say that this is, he's doing these things just for personal power would be wrong. But there are a lot of different motives. The uh, other point I would make is, at the same time, Maliki is trying to strengthen his office, his control, his loyalists. Um, the Kurds are trying to, uh, to strengthen the office of the president. Now, the presidency in Iraq was supposed to be cosmetic, a figurehead, OK, and we'll give it to the Kurds now. The Kurds are not supposed to have ownership of that. It's just like they don't, they're not going to own the foreign ministry, but we've only had a Kurdish foreign minister. Point being why it's not like Lebanon. You cannot guarantee to each sect, you will have this, you will have that. Iraq, and I think this is one of the things that, that uh, David said, it is not the Sunni Arabs, the Shia Arabs, and the Kurds, period. And if you start to move into a constitution which guarantees things like Lebanon does, you are moving into a balkanized system, which would not be, uh, I think, good for Iraq. And I would have to think that they, they don't want. But uh, how do you get there is the question. And I guess my answer is, is, is a stupid one, but it's not easy and not quick. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Talking with a good Iraqi friend recently, who uh, had a senior position until recently, he said that more people in Iraq are expressing fear about autocracy yeah. than they are about reconciliation. Mm. That a lot of people are very worried that this formerly weak prime minister is now getting so strong that he mm. may be digging himself into office permanently. Right. And then the other thing is when you look down the road with a weak central government, if you have one, and you're building up strong security forces and an army, would you end up 10 years from now with a general mm. in charge? Mm. That certainly has been the history in Iraq. And I'm not so sure that we wouldn't, in the end, accept that if we had no choice, but uh, uh, in, because there may be a great need for stability. You, you hear many Iraqis themselves say they would accept that. That, yeah. that an autocratic rule from the center what else have they ever would be had? powerful and hold it together. If security is your basic issue, is that how we ensure security? But again, Iraqis are worried as the prime minister strengthens and the central government strengthens that what they're looking at is the militarization of society, which carries a lot of connotations. The military was always very strong. It was a power broker in Iraqi society. Uh, are we coming back to that? And militarization of civil society, meaning that everything is geared towards the creation of what would look like a very what, Saddam-like, a very controlled government. Well, that's I mean, uh, a fear. I think uh, the, the, the two, two main, main issues in, 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 in trying to, to have people agree in Iraq. One is the sharing of political power political participation by, by the Sunnis who, who feel that after the war, the Shiites have been empowered at their expense. So we, we have to get them in the political process, and they have to feel that there is an equitable sharing of political power. The second one is an equitable, an equitable sharing of, of the oil resources. And this mm. is key, mm. because the Sunnis feel that all the oil resources uh, might be in areas where they have no control and no power, and uh, they, that uh, as a result, and she, yes, Shias and the Kurds. So these two issues, political sharing of power and, and economic sharing of the oil resources, are key to bring people together. Okay. We are getting great questions that are generating great responses, but we have four questions left. So we're gonna maybe we can try to go through the questions a little bit more promptly. Thank you. 
Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Shahla Wali. I am from Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and I am from Iraq, so bear with me some, some comments. Welcome. First of all, I would like to thank Kennedy School and this forum and panelists to talk about Iraq. Any initiative or step to talk about Iraq thrilled me because we need the solutions and we need to, to understand what's going on in Iraq clearly. This is first. Second, I would like to uh, second um, uh, comment of uh, Professor Yafet talking about there are no Iraqi voices here. And in most panels I've been in Washington or here, I didn't see an Iraqi voice talk about what we need. You guys realize it, but still we don't have anybody in we the panelists. Now. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the thin, uh, third thing I would like to speak about is that um, two important points. I would consider the process of rebuilding Iraq and, and really the merge into transition period to toward the first step to rebuild Iraq it started in 2007. Not only by the surge and the understanding of the Sunni tribals of Al-Qaeda's uh, great damage uh, did to, to the region, this is not only this fact, the other fact that the all political parties in Iraq realize that they are at the edge of the valley and they don't want to get into this deep valley and they are turning into more political negotiation, reconciliation process about even uh, every single crisis and issues coming into their way. And this has happened in 2008 with several crises. In northern Iraq and Kurdistan, there was just recently a crisis about minister, uh, Prime Minister Maliki taking tanks to Jalawla Khanaqi in Kirkuk, trying to avow authority. Everybody, I am the first one, hold my breath because I felt that there will be a new phase of, of conflict. But what happened? Which was really great step toward reconciliation. The four, uh, four leaders, Tariq al Hashimi, Jalal Salabani, uh, Prime Minister Maliki, uh, Masoud Barzani, met and diffused the, the conflict. The other step is that Shahristani, just uh, the Ministry of Oil in Iraq, signed a contract with the Kurdistan leadership about reconciliating the, the disputed uh, oil contract. So what I am saying, I think we have to be more updated about the things going on in Iraq. Because as so an Iraqi, I, I feel- May I interrupt for one second and ask you to turn it toward a question? Because oh, well, I love we. Thank yeah, God sorry. we have someone Just who is from quickly. Iraq here, but we need a question. Well, actually, it's more comments than a question. But, Just but very quickly, the... we are translating things, but we okay. need the help of international because okay. we are but in process. one of the ground rules is it needs to be a question. So maybe you yeah, can bring it to a question. Yeah, the, please. very quickly. And the third is the Kurds demand and whether the Shia demands and, and stuff like that. Building a new country for ourselves needs uh, need everybody to talk what we need Iraq to look like. The Kurds have the right to talk about their rights, the Shias, the Sunnis, but there is nothing in a process that you have to hash hash somebody just because the international community want to solve the dispute very quickly. The third issue, Iran. Iran's intervention in Iraq, everybody knows it's negatively. And America need to address this. And before that, Iraqis need to address this because Iran's intervention negatively, we need to diffuse it by understanding their interest and trying to steer into more positive relations because they are our neighbors and the U.S. is leaving. So we have to understand this. Uh, the Arab League, I would like to uh, hear from the ambassador. As if Iraq's after 2003 treated by all Arab states, and sorry for this, like Egypt after two, uh, 1973. Everybody boycotted us. I've been in Jordan and Emirates, and, and this is process of boycotting even Iraqi people, not even the, the prime minister and the cabinet. Why is that? And where are you guys to come, not only by conferences in Sharm el Sheikh, but by opening embassies? Thank you so for thank bringing you. it to a question. Mr. Ambassador. OK, I just comment on the last question, I guess. Uh, well, the, the Arab League, uh, as I said at first, was against the war. Uh, but uh, it is also the first organization that has accepted the Iraqi representatives in the work of the League. Just after the war, there was a meeting of foreign ministers in September just mm -hmm. after the war, and, and the Arab League has invited, they were representative of what was called at the time the provisional authority. Right. It was not even a government, and they have invited them to take part. And this opened the way for the Iraqis to be, to be also represented at the United Nations and all other organizations. So the Arab League has been keen for the Iraqi to continue their membership in the League, to preserve their, their identity and their links with the Arab world. 
Of course, they were a bit uh, reluctant at first to, to engage the new government till, till there were elections because there was a question of legitimacy, to be, to be honest with you. The, the, there, was, there was a big question in the Arab world, is this war leg legitimate? Was it, was it approved by the United Nations, by Security Council? Uh, is this a, a, a legitimate uh, Iraqi government? Mm -hmm. But after a while, when the elections took place and, and there was an, an Iraqi government elected by the people, when the United Nations also uh, give, give its, uh, its, uh, its approval and, and, and mandates to the presence of, of the coalition forces, then the Arab League became, and all the Arab countries, much more involved. And, and now we have representations at a high level uh, in, in, in Baghdad by Arab states. Uh, you have the Arab League, uh, uh, as I said, uh, sponsoring some donors conference, mm. encouraging the Arab business to go into Iraq. So the, it has changed completely. At the beginning, it wasn't like this. So I think it can continue to, to play this, this active role. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, Marvin Brams at Divinity School. Uh, has any weight or consideration been given at this point to the need for American aid and assistance to rebuild the Iraqi economy even after the troops are gone? Because if there is, uh, it probably means an American presence in Iraq for decades. In fact, my view is we may never go home entirely. Uh, that's an excellent question. People think you know, we're going to end the war, uh, the Americans are going to come home. I think America is going to be in Iraq, or Americans are going to be in Iraq and in the Gulf region a long time. Uh, there is business, there is investment, there is development. But the question you ask, uh, and I think the answer is not, uh, is the United States committed to more money towards reconstruction? And there I think there is no money and has not been in this year's budget either for new uh, commitments of money to rebuilding reconstruction, certainly not as we saw in the first uh, mm -hmm. couple of years. Um, but I, having said that, yes, I think you know we're going to be there. All the troops coming out, you're going to have a force there. You're going to have a presence there, and you're going to have people who are there, Americans who want to be there because of business for whatever reason. So to say, well, we're just going to get out, it doesn't happen. A new Marshall Plan, no, I didn't say that. But you also don't pull out quickly. We have 150,000 troops there, the same amount as before we started the surge. You don't bring a force like that uh, and all that we have there home mm -hmm. in 30 days. Mm -hmm. Milton, did you have something you want to? Well, the difference between uh, businessmen and academics and uh, oil, oil producers on the one hand and an army of occupation in another. I think the Iraqis are perfectly happy to re-engage in international commerce. Uh, that's what they want. I don't think they are willing to have an army there. And I think they are scared stiff about uh, the bases we are building, this huge complex we built in the middle of Baghdad. Uh, I think um, they would like to, and I keep hearing this on the panel, but then we keep bouncing back uh, that yes, Iraqis have to uh, solve the problems for themselves, and self-determination is what the Arabs have been asking for uh, since they began to contemplate their independence at the end of World War I. Uh, and we can't do it by continuing to have an army. It's, it just isn't an appropriate excuse to say, well, we're not going to get our 150,000 people out of there immediately. Nobody's talking about immediately. We're talking about whether we are going to have a, a, a a facade of freedom with an American army there. I don't think the Iraqis want that. It seemed a welcome um, expression of resistance to that to see the Shia protest that happened the other day uh, in response to the, to the announcement that the US presence would continue. And I thought it was interesting to see it as a civic demonstration rather than military conflict. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Very quick thing, and that yes. is, we need to remember, I think, to keep our expectations modest. Iraq yeah. is not going to be a model democracy. They've got a very tough road ahead in establishing a reasonably stable system. And the same people who got us into the war are, again, trying to sell this as this will be a strong American ally in the mm -hmm. Middle East and a model democracy. They're kidding themselves, just like they kidded us before. 
Yeah. Good evening. My name is Shema Bhalal. I'm in the college. I'm a sophomore. There was a very interesting question that was brought up. It was about the role of the Arabs and where were the Arabs. And I guess my question might be specific to Ambassador Hasuna. But my question is, has the Arab League um, improved or does it have suggestions in trying to deal, trying to, pre to prevent the situations like Iraq instead of dealing with it after it happens, after a crisis of, of you know, dictatorships, and I mean, you can find it, it could be evident in, in many other countries. Um, has it proposed any solutions for this? And if it has, then how can it, how much authority does it have to actually implement those suggestions? Good question. Well, I mean, uh, the, the question of preventive diplomacy is, is of course, uh, very relevant here, and, and this is an issue faced by the United Nations, by the Arab League, by the African Union, by the European Union, by all organizations. And uh, as soon as a crisis erupts somewhere, the organization will try to, to get hold of the facts, will send a fact-finding mission, uh, will uh, try to intervene, to mediate. In, in, in the case of Iraq, the Arab League has tried to, to, to prevent uh, the war. The Secretary General of the League, one year before the, the war erupted, went to Iraq, and, and I happened to be with him. I was at the time posted at the United Nations in New York, and he asked me to come, and we, we went, and we met the leadership of Iraq, and he tried to convince them to accept a return of the UN inspectors that were trying to say if there were weapons of mass dis destruction in Iraq or not. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, it's happened that they accepted the return of the inspectors, but it was a bit too late because there was no trust anymore between, between uh, the regime of Saddam Hussein and, and the United States and, and the rest of the world. But the League tried, tried to prevent the war from happening because it, it knew the devastating effects, for, not just for Iraq, for, for, for the whole region. Mm. So it's, it's, it's not easy. When you have a crisis, you try to contain it, uh, but at one point, uh, no, one, no one could stop the war somehow. I mean, the United Nations couldn't do it, uh, no other organization, but sh surely the League tried to, mm. to prevent it. Thank you. We, we have come to 5.30, so it is supposed to be the end of the evening. We have time for one more question, and I am supposed to end with the last question. But I'm going to defer my question to you. But first, we will have you ask a very quick question and a quick response, and then I will give the last question to you. OK, Go ahead. sure, thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. My name is Aaron Williams. I'm at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. My question is to Ambassador Hasuna. If I understood you correctly, you seem to suggest that a grand comprehensive strategy would be the best way to achieve peace and reconciliation in Iraq and in the region in general. So my question is, do you not think that linkage and a large comprehensive strategy that seeks to address issues in Iraq, Israel, Palestine, and elsewhere might be too ambitious and too large to manage effectively? No, I don't think it's, it's too ambitious. I think it's much needed. And I think that someone like uh, President-elect Obama does realize this. Because even the other day when he announced the formation of his national security team, he mentioned the Arab-Israeli issue as one of his priorities. So he knows the importance of that. And, and of course, he knows Iraq is extremely important. He knows that dealing with, with Iran and trying to solve the nuclear issue in Iran is extremely important. So I think, as I said, all these issues are, are linked. And I hope the new administration can deal with them in, a, in, a, in an open way, in a rational way, and it will have the support of the whole world. It's not easy, but I think we, we have to, to hope, and, and, and yes, we can, as he said. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so this is uh, the last question will be for you, sir. Thank you, Charles. Uh, my name is Abdul Razak Saadi. I'm an Iraqi student at Kennedy School. Ambassador Hassan, I just talked about the political sharing power. So as my question is, what's the mechanism you could have to to share the powers in, in Iraq. And we had an election, which is not perfect, but I think it was the best among the Arab wars. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? 
Yeah, so and the, the other question is, the uh, Secretary General of the Arab Leagues always said we stand in one distance from Iraqi party. So my question, is that including the Ba'athists? Because now I think mm. the Ba'athists, the former regime, they want to use the, the, the support of the Arab Leagues to have a political uh, power in Iraq. Well, if you want my own view on this, you have to draw a distinction between the Ba'athists and, and, and the terrorists and, and those who, who, who are killing innocent civilians. The Ba'athists, all of Iraq was Ba'athists at one point. I'm and talking high rank Ba'athists, not all the, I mean, the, 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 the former regime, the Saddam's former regime. Well, people from the, the former regime who are not responsible for, for crimes should get integrated in, in, in the system. And, and I think this has been recognized. When, when, when Bremer came into power, one of the big mistakes he did, and it is recognized today, that he just got rid of, of, of the army that existed at the time. The, 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 the higher echelon, the lower echelon, everyone. And then, now, th this army has been reintegrated. Because, yeah, the commanders who were responsible, those who committed crimes against the Iraqi people, yes, of course, those, they have to be punished, they were put on trial and so on. But the small, uh, the small so, echelon... Sorry, is that should be part of the constellations? They, they should be included the punishment in the, of in the, the system. Who and and the they crimes? are, they are. Sorry. They came back now. And, and they are part of, of, of the army. Of course, they were part of the Basist regime, but, uh, but they were not responsible for the crimes. So this is, this is important. If you want reconciliation, you must get all, all the Iraqis. Those who committed crimes, yes, you punish them. But you cannot generalize anyone who, who belonged to the Basist party should have no role, because then you push him in, into, into become uh, violent, in, into... into trying to, to use force uh, to, uh, to, to even survive and so on. So this is the way. You have to alienate the, the violent people, those who, who worked with the Qaeda, those who want to use force to, to achieve the political uh, objectives, and those who want to be part of the system. You have to integrate them in the system. This is how I look at it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. I, um, I was supposed to come up with this great last question that could pull everything together. Instead, I think we've ended on a note that is about what a challenge it's going to be to work toward reconciliation, which is probably a fair place to end. But I want to thank you all for coming. I also want to thank, again, our co-sponsors, the Middle East Initiative, the Middle East Forum at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, and the MENA Conference. And uh, it was an extraordinary night. I really appreciate all of the input from the panelists. It was, it was a great opportunity to explore this. And I think we're on the cusp of a, of a moment with the Obama administration now where there can be a, a, a new direction toward a more multilateral approach and toward a fresh start. So thank you. Thank you.